Well, hello and good morning, everyone. It is Christy. It is Sunday, and it is time for Social Science Sunday. I'm just gonna sing my background just a little bit. Where is that coming from? Right here. Okay, just tidying up a little bit in the back. I hope you guys are doing well. Happy um, Sunday. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever it is, whenever it is you are. I hope you are doing well. Today, we are going to start off with, or the whole focus actually, is going to be better listening skills. Uh, and believe me, this is something that I have not perfected um, <laughs> yet either. However, it is a good life skill to have. And even if you're not always, you know, doing it well, if you know the tips that I'm going to go through with, here with you today, then you might become a better listener just in your life in general. So, yeah, before we start, I want to say hello to the people who um, have already mentioned that they're here in the chat. So, hey, Flint, thank you for stopping by. Sibby, good to see you. Easy7, um, thanks for all the stuff you post in the Discord as well. And DNF fan. So, thanks all for making time to be with me today. All right, we're going to go ahead. I've kind of changed up my thing. What? <laughs> All right, I've changed uh, the, the setup a little bit so that I'm looking hopefully in the right direction now, this way, toward the slides. And we're going to go ahead um, and get started. All right, why is, why is listening an important thing to work on when you're doing qualitative research? And... I guess we're going to start with the lecture notes because I, I do make my notes in here. You know, like I do mention things. Uh, when I had my live class, I just had people. I loved your cross stitch, Deanne Van. Yes, absolutely. Thanks for posting that in the in the um, Discord. So in my normal live course, I would have people talk and interact for about two minutes. And, you know, uh, we can't really do that here. But you can imagine a general conversation that you have with people. I think if you... There are times... When we go to a meeting, like a business meeting, or even meet up with someone we know, and initially we're quite engaged, but at points our, our attention begins to drift a little bit. But in qualitative research, because we're, whenever we're talking to people through interviews or focus groups um, or um, doing ethnographic research where we're observing them in their natural settings and how they behave, then it's really important that we focus on the ways in which we're paying attention. As I'm going to say, everything is data when it comes to other people. Everything is data. And qualitative research has this flexibility that quantitative doesn't. Quantitative research gives everybody the same stimulus. And ontologically and epistemologically, it makes sense. From a quantitative point of view, if a causal phenomenon, if something that a causal mechanism that exists in the world is real, right? ontologically it exists and epistemologically we can observe it, then in theory, every person who experiences that causal mechanism should have a similar reaction. Let's just like break this down, right? It doesn't matter if I drop like my chopstick <laughs> in my room or, um, uh, what else do I have? Uh, yeah, I keep by floss, All right? Gravity is going to operate the same on both of these. Now, if I take this tissue that I had before that I was using to tidy up, it might fall at a slightly different rate because of resistance, but the causal mechanism, causal mechanism of gravity operates identically on all phenomenon, even if it has variations in the rate of fall. Right? That's the basic premise of a, a deterministic worldview. Things are things exist. They're real, and they have a similar uh, effect. That mentality is brought over into the social sciences, and I think it's probably best illustrated by experimental research. When you do behavioral experimental behavioral research, if you want to, for instance, you know, stimulate both conservative leaning and and um, hold on, I I broke one of my D and D things earlier today, and I'm gluing it shut and or gluing it together, and it's still it's kind of tipping over. I have to fix that later. Anyway, uh, <laughs> if you have this um, quantitative stimuli, then if you bring people into the lab, then you should get very similar results, controlling for every other possible source of variation in someone's behavior. That's, that's, you're trying to isolate a causal mechanism. And as a consequence, you're really focused on giving people stimuli and recording their responses. So a lot of thought goes into how do you present a stimuli? In what way do you do that? Do you 
you know, how do you phrase things or what visual images do you pick? There's a lot of thought and planning that goes into the stimuli and also on recording the response. But in qualitative research, we don't have an agenda. Like we, we might have questions that we're interested in, but we're coming at this from an inductive process. And we're not trying to control for every source of variation. We're trying to find other sources of variation. Right? Um, yes, yes, Flint. Uh, yes, we're, but we're also in a localized mass incident, uh, induced curvature of space-time socially as well. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> and therefore, we can't be narrowly focused on other possible drivers of an, of an event or an outcome or something that we observe. But we can't measure what we don't see. And that's why I wanted to give this lecture to really focus on qualitative research listening as a research practice that allows you to do high quality data collection in order to capture things that might explain the variable of interest or the thing that you're dependent variable, the thing that you're interested in explaining. All right. um, and then it also has some knockover benefits for real life. So that's kind of the thing. And in order to pay attention to this sort of information, you need to know what to look for. You can't measure what you can't notice. That means that we're going to talk about active listening, not only in terms of keeping a focused concentration on what someone is saying, but also it means paying attention to their body language. Ideally, you want to, if you really wanted to be quite hypersensitive, you could make some notes on when people pause. For instance, Kevin and I in the happy hour last week watched, or sorry, last Friday, watched a Jordan Peterson answer. No, we watched Jordan, Jordan Peterson waffle on and talk absolute rubbish for 14 minutes. And then at the very end, give a two sentence answer that he could have given at the start and saved everyone 14 minutes of their lives to do something more enjoyable. But in the beginning of it, the interviewer posed a question to Jordan Peterson and Jordan Peterson paused and then he repeated the question, and then he paused, and then he started to answer it. Now, from psychology, we could assess this moment in Jordan Peterson's waffling life to say that the question posed to him was not something he immediately had an answer to. And so the pausing was a both pauses on the front and the end of the repetition of the question, as well as the repetition of the question itself, was him taking time to formulate a response because he didn't have one. So that is one way you could distinguish between, if you wanted to do, a whole analysis of Jordan Peterson, how he behaves when he's in territory, conceptual territory, he doesn't have a good grounding in, and he needs a little time to orient himself and before he goes off in a tangent. Another thing is facial expressions. What people say with their mouths and what they say with their bodies can be very different. Sarcasm doesn't come across in text. When you're transcribing an interview or a focus group, you can't, you know, it isn't immediately apparent what lines are sarcasm. One of the ways that you can help distinguish that as you're turning in, your, or sorry, as you're interpreting your data, if you have a video recording, it would be to look at the facial expressions. You know, maybe someone says, oh, yeah, I really love Donald Trump, you know, and then they roll their eyes. Well, Unless you make a note of that eye roll, that text is going to be read very differently. Uh, another thing you can take a look at is hand gestures. It might be important that someone is using a particular hand gesture at a particular time. You know, like, like, like oh, I really had to, like, work hard to get the top off of the, I don't know, jar of pickles or jalapeno peppers, if I'm honest, in, in my case. And, you know, em which physical gestures they choose to emphasize or let's say that they, they tap on the table. They tap on the table when they want to emphasize things when they're talking, but they only do it at specific points. And picking up on this tell or picking up on this mode of communicating might help you distinguish between the times that a speaker is talking and, and other times when they're really passionate about a topic. It doesn't kind of matter what the data is. It's all data, but you can't analyze that if you don't notice. And you don't notice if you're not looking for it, which is why we come back to active, active listening. All right, so what does it mean to be a good listener? What are the skill sets you need in order to be an active listener? You really have to concentrate on hearing people and listening to people. And that means 
being able to shut down parts of your brain that are working 100% of the time. And that takes some skill and some practice and awareness of how your brain works. It also means that you are really focused on empathetically comprehending what another person is saying. And I think perhaps this is the hardest part of doing active listening at any point in time. Because in order to really be an active listener, you have to almost shut out your own thoughts, your own reactions, your own answers, your own anticipation of what they're going to say, and really be in the moment with another person. Really wait and try to actively understand what they are trying to communicate with you. And I don't mean just under like write down the words that they said and be accurate in what they are saying. I mean actually looking at the world from their perspective and trying to understand why this particular view or opinion or approach or activity makes sense to them. And here is the poem that I read you last time. His thoughts were slow, his words were few, and never made to glisten. But he was a joy wherever he went. You should have heard him listen. And this is not something we do intuitively. Human beings generally are really bad listeners uh, as a default because our brains are very busy and are always doing things. In order to be a good listener, here are some tips that you can practice. And do this consciously and see if your experience of talking to another person changes, is what I would recommend. You really have to, I think, it's one thing to hear these notes and these tips and these ideas and go, yeah, that makes sense. Of course, this is all quite intuitive. But even with a newsreader or when someone in on an interview is interviewing like a politician or a member of the public or whatever else, ah, I got mosquito bites. I'm going to have to put on some cream because my bites are itching. Stupid mosquitoes. Right. <laughs> Try these tips either with someone in your real life, if you have people that you can talk to, or even just on television or in radio. Um, television's better that because they have visual cues then as well. See if you can do this. First step is remove all distracting thoughts from your mind. This is already hard. If you are having a bad day emotionally, if you're stressed out, if you're tired, if your brain has already been through a lot that day and isn't, you know, it's a bit foggy, then that's, that will be an, ups, an obstacle. Is Peterson finally gone from Twitter? I hope so. Right. Then there can be other things that will distract you, depending, let's say you go and you interview someone in, in a coffee shop. Right? Like It's not the best place to do an interview, but it's public, so strangers will feel more comfortable there. But you're going to have the sounds of the coffee being made, the clinking of the cups and the spoons. You're going to have people talking and placing their orders. You're going to have a, a tr maybe traffic going by in the front of the store. If the door is open, it might be loud. The the environment itself can be a distraction, even if it's just a momentary, like looking over your shoulder because someone dropped their cup and it's smashed. That can pull you out of your data collection, your interview, for instance. And we talked about thoughts and also there's emotions. Your emotions can play a big role in your ability to stay focused, to stay in the moment to pay attention to someone else rather than your endorphin rush or maybe you're down about something and maybe, you know, yeah, you're, you're stressed out. And so it really requires you to almost have a bit of a zen in the moment and be like, okay, I'm going to empty myself of my emotions. I'm going to put all these things aside for a moment. I'm going to become an open space, a receptive space that is going to focus on being in the moment with this other person or other people, depending on what it is. Other things that can impede your ability to do active listening if you're in pain, if you're uncomfortable, if, yeah, your ADHD will make this hard, probably. But I would also say then too, like, don't expect yourself to be perfect and be able to do it for like, you know, an hour and a half at a time. Try with just a couple minutes. You know? And if you fade out to just like say, oh, can you know, sorry, I'm, I got a little bit distracted. Can you repeat that? If someone understands you have ADHD, it's not a problem. But it's more like just dipping into this rather than thinking, oh, yeah, I need to be able to do this for a 90 minute focus group tomorrow. No, that's not going to happen. So if you're in pain, um, if you're physically uncomfortable, these are going to be distractions. If you really don't like the other person speaking, it's going to be harder, right? Um, it's harder to have empathy with people we don't like. And one of the things that, you know, I don't agree with UKIP voters. I don't agree with 
I don't think we had any BNP voters in our um, in our focus groups. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how I feel about a participant. They are there giving me their time, giving me research data. They are showing me a great kindness. They are um, willing to open up on something as personal as their politics. And that's for some people, it's, you know, a, kind of a taboo thing. And therefore, I, I, in my research, I kind of feel like I extend them that courtesy by putting my judgments and my attitudes and leaving them at the door. There's, because my place is not to, if I'm a researcher, I'm there to be a good researcher and collect good data and be aware of any biases or filters that I have, declare them. But ideally, you just want to get good data from your participant that other researchers would look at and come to a similar conclusion. Maybe you're not interested in the topic, or, or maybe they're using terms that you don't understand. Anything that's a barrier between you and an empathetic connection to the speaker is going to make it more difficult to understand where they're coming from. If someone from the physics department got up and started giving a lecture, not in layman's terms, but in you know quite high-level academic terminology, then my ability to really understand what that person is thinking, what she or they might be thinking is 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 much more difficult and we'll need follow-ups and clarifications and i already talked about background noises such as tv or coffee shop whatnot so rem remember it's not only your internal weather system that can make it more difficult for you to really be there for someone but it can also be the environment and for that purpose this is why it's a good idea to you know if you're going to do an interview do it in a quiet place do it in someone's office where it, you know, they're on their grounds, they're comfortable, maybe, or uh, someplace, again, you know, like, if you, all you have is a public location, then, you know, you have to kind of do what you, what, what you do. But ideally, you want to make sure that the physical environment is ex as conducive to focused concentration on what someone is saying or communicating as a, you know, um, a private one could be. Right, next up. Uh, oh, 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 what did I do there? Okay, oh yeah, that's the next one. That's great. Okay, hearing versus listening, and I think I said hearing before, but I think I should have been. It should have been listening in the notes. Anyway, hearing versus listening. So hearing is the physiological process. We're going to define hearing as this, right, for the purposes of this, the rest of this lecture. Hearing is the physiological process of transmitting from the world to our brains sounds, and listening. We're going to define as a psychological process of interpreting and attempting to understand what is being heard. There are two, you can see how these are different. And we all know that there are times when someone is talking to us and we're half listening. We're half listening enough to know what they said and maybe even the tone of their voice if they're annoyed, but we're not actively listening to them. We're kind of like juggling our attention between them and something that we want to do more or find more interesting. And even if we can repeat back to them what they just said, we're not really engaged. Um, but we do this as a defense mechanism to prove, yeah, yeah, actually, I, I am paying attention to what you said, even when we're not. Because you dipped in on the last bit when they're like, oh, you didn't even hear what I said. And you just kind of like rewind. Oh, yeah, uh, you said we need to get milk. See, I can, I can listen to you and watch TV at the same time. Hold on one quick second. I am having a problem with my... Mouse wanting to keep going over to the other screen. All right, let's scroll down. Now, I want to say that it is not our innate ability to be good li good listeners. In fact, everything about our physio physiology points to the fact that being a good listener is overcoming all of the presets away from that our brains already set up against us from good listening. So, our brains are a major obstacle to being a very good listener. And understanding that our brains are unruly and untamed and can run all over the place and like need to be, you know, roped in. You need to wrangle your brain, wrangle your thoughts. You're not going to do it perfectly at first, but just being aware of it, you're already at a big advantage. So we talk at a rate of 120 to 150 words per minute. In fact, you already know that if you've, you're seeing the my slides, you've probably already read ahead. All right. This is what I'm talking about. People read ahead and they get distracted. Or... We think ahead, right? Because we think at a rate of between 600 and 800 words per second. So no matter what you, like, even if you wanted to, 
as a listener, you're probably going to be in some way anticipating what the speaker is saying. We think between four and five times faster than we can speak, so our brains are always going to be racing ahead. And the listener, you as a listener, might think, oh, I know where this is going. And that is like one of the, one of the ways of checking out in, a, in the moment with someone is to go, oh, I know what they're going to say. Because then we stop paying attention, we stop uh, being open, and we just start waiting for what we think is going to happen. So what does it mean to be a good listener? Well, when listening to anything like a bright, energetic, young uh, lecturer or the radio, our minds can wander and we lose concentration. And that's not unnatural. That is the default. Our brains, like I said, are quite messy and, and untamed. We can get lost in our own thoughts, completely lose the meaning of words, even though we can hear them. How many times, you know, you can think about sitting in a talk or a lecture and yeah, the first 10, 15 minutes, you're there and then something happens and your mind wanders. You can look, your face looks like I am with you. I am, you can even nod occasionally because you can dip into the conversation, but your brain is on vacation. It's understanding that this as well, that it's tiring to pay attention to people If you are going to be doing any qualitative research, maybe you want to keep your interviews to 30 minutes to start off with. Because to ask someone to talk for an hour and a half and to be that actively present with them the entire time, you'll have your recording machine, you know, you'll have your voice recorder or a video recorder in order to pick up, you know, a permanent record of the data, ideally. But understand that you you have to build this up like a muscle. And the more you're interested in a person, the more you're interested in what you're say- they're saying, and the more you're emotionally invested, the easier it will be to stay focused. But be aware that this is like a muscle you're going to have to train up a bit. Okay, how to be a better listener. Stop anticipating. I am terrible at this. I am terrible at this. I often, and I think it's a moment of empathy. I will try to anticipate what someone is going to say, or if they're stumbling over a word, I'll try to fill it in. Now, that, sometimes that's okay, because people genuinely don't um, always have the right words at the tip of their tongue. But sometimes I guess wrong. And I'll say, oh, is it like this? And they're like, no, not really. So if I would have just freaking waited, I could have heard. So don't assume you know where a speaker is going. Don't interrupt on the assumption that you know what they're going to say if you want to be an active listener. Don't finish their sentences. Um, You know, you might guess the wrong ending. And so this is for more like qualitative stuff. Sometimes if you're having a conversation with someone and they're struggling to try to articulate what it is, you know, you putting a word out in a real world conversation, not like in a data collection conversation, will help them like, yeah, or no, like that's not quite it, but it's close. But um, if you're in the the middle of an interview with somebody and you just keep interrupting them going, oh, okay, yeah, I see where you're going with this. Let's get on to the next question. You're not really being an active listener. You're not collecting data. Next thing is don't speak over the other person. Give them enough space. Thing is, like, you also have to balance this a little bit because if you have someone for 30 minutes and you have, let's say, 12 questions you want to get through and you're halfway through the interview, you've only done two questions, you might have to f- focus things up a little bit or just accept that you're going to only get like a third of your questions done, a little bit of a jog, but you don't want to give people like the impression that you're hurried, like, okay, get out, you know, like finish this up, finish this up, because then they're going to naturally have a tendency to want to shorten their own answers and be more brief. So time management is a different issue, but yeah, try not to speak over the people you're interviewing. Another way that you can maintain better concentration is to try to be with them in their emotional state empathetically at the time. Let's go to a difficult uh, thing for like for me in our study. You know, we had one of our participants who was, oh, yes, British colonialism was bad. But hey, you know, in India, they got the railroads. And that's really hard for me <laughs> to um, go yeah, why don't you say a little bit more about that? Like, how do you see that working out or, um, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, it does require you walk a little bit in the mile of someone else's shoes, but it doesn't mean you have to take on their point of view forever, but you want to empathetically connect with this other person in order to do what is the next point, which is paraphrase. You want to repeat back 
what they're saying in slightly different language, not identical language, because generally you're, then you're not getting anything out. But if you want to probe a little bit, if you want to expand, if you want to clarify, and you're coming at it from the wrong location emotionally, it's going to be much more difficult for you to be able to grasp what that they're trying to convey to you. And so being emotionally empathetic, at least to the point where you're like, so I guess what you're saying is you're acknowledging there are a lot of human rights violations, but um, there are also um, some legacy items that we're, we're able to build on. Like, I'm not justifying. I'm just trying, again, as an example, this is a hard one for me. But to be a good researcher, you have to, yeah, make sure that you are feeding back when people are talking about their emotions especially, to verify that you've understood what's been said. Okay, paralanguage. We talked a little bit about paying attention to body language when people use their hands, um, maybe when they lean back, when they lean forward. I, I mentioned on the happy hour how I, I tend to watch a lot of police interrogation videos because police interrogations are very big on paralanguage, very big on um, body language signals. And all of that is data. All of it is data. What's going on here? All right. It's not just what's said, but it's how it's said. This is especially important for when they find clusters of like three to five behaviors at a certain particular time that indicate a person is being uh, deceptive or cagey in some kind of way. All right, uh, here's a classic. When someone says, hey, you want to hear a joke? And then they turn, uh, sorry, white people. White people who <laughs> say, like, hey, you want to hear a joke? Look over their shoulders, lean in and drop their voice. What kind of cue does this give you? Right? I mean, think about it. Like, if someone did that, what would you be expecting them to do? Tell some sort of inappropriate joke, Right? They're lowering their voice because they are aware that what they're about to say is socially unacceptable, but they think that you will be in on the joke. Another way to think about paralanguage is the rate of speed. If someone is speaking quite slowly and deliberately, it might be the case that they are trying to be very precise with their terms in order to be clear with their language or Maybe they're struggling to articulate their emotions. On the other hand, if they're like, oh my God, I'm so excited. This thing is going to happen and oh, I can't wait. It's going to be great. All right. You can see that um, that agitation, that emotion is expressed because like they're literally bursting. <laughs> the words are bursting forth from them in an excitement. And it's a very different vibe than the one I was demonstrating through pauses. And paying attention to tone and pitch and inflection, something you cannot do in a text just by typing it out, is important for giving you the context of where of, of what the words are meant to mean. Let's look at this example. You want me to go? Versus you want me to go? versus what you want me to go versus you want me to go all of these have a slightly different tone to them and there's that's not something you can pick up on just by writing out the text depends again on how in depth into one person you want to go but these are all ways for you to think about how to better key in on what somebody else is trying to communicate and also doing that feedback process to make sure you're understanding them accurately or as least as accurately as, as possible. Now, here's a test. Are you active listening to me right now or are you just hearing me? Um, are you, you know, have me on in the background while you're doing something else and, uh, you know, sometimes you fade out or are you just sat in front of your screen? Focused. Try active listening when you are listening to a podcast or in a lecture. Obviously, this was written for my students. So like, yeah, active listening to me during my, during my lectures. When we had a sort of um, practice focus group and interview sessions, practice active listening with a partner. Just if you have someone in your life, don't tell them this, but just from your own side, 
go, okay, next five minutes, I'm going to try to just really focus on only what this person is saying and be that empty receptacle of information. Try to clear your emotions and try to understand their emotional state of mind. Don't anticipate what they're going to say. Feed back to them with, with probing questions. Maybe make a notice of their body language when they move and, and just see if it's your, if, how it changes your conversation with another human being to really be present with them and really physically like and emotionally and attention wise be there for them really trying to understand them and I think that's it it's going to be a short one today I think because a lot of this stuff isn't difficult in concept a lot of it is based in common sense however it's very difficult to do in practice. And I guess today we're going to be doing... It's okay. <laughs> of course, you can have this on in the background, Age of the K. But my point is, that is how we live most of our lives. So I'm going to just going to natter here for a few minutes so that we have um, time to do some questions in case there are any. There might not be any. But in case there are some, I wanted to give you all a chance. I wonder if I can put this... I'll just leave it the way it is. But yeah, I'll have a little look here. I'm going to... Well, next week. Yeah, let's talk a bit about what's up next week. If you have questions on active listening... Um, ugh, stupid academia.edu. <laughs> Qualitative research methods. Uh, I guess I can swap back over in all, in, in all honesty. We've got a little... No, that's not what I wanted. Stupid... Um, come on. Give me qualitative research methods. I'll just go to my own page. I swear to God, academia.edu make it difficult to find your own papers on their bloody on their bloody website. All right, qualitative research. <laughs> How to do qualitative research interviewing? Okay, that's that sounds fun. Yeah, and we'll talk about the difference between like interviews and qualitative. Uh, sorry, and focus groups. They're very very similar in terms of like the structures of them, but. Like how how much you can do and the kinds of data you can collect. What? Oh, sorry, that's my. I thought I plugged you in. Let's see. I am listening while being a smart arse in the chat, but we'll also listen back later when I'm less pooped out. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Fine. That's good. Trains are also ready to move around an impressive army and guns. What are you guys talking about? Ukraine in my chat? What's going on there? All right. Uh, I think this is going to be about it. I'm sorry it's a short one today, but on the other hand, um, you know. It is what it is. I, I, I give you quality content. I'm not going to take up your time if I don't have something of value to offer. Uh, I, as always, if you are all, at all interested, I've got the Discord link. I've updated it in the chat ski box or in the description box underneath. You can go ahead and click on that. Uh, yeah. If you want to hear more of my dulcet tones, you can always go over to the Twitch channel, Rolling Left. Uh, and we'll watch some D&D &D tonight with my, my party. But other than that, we're going to have an early class ending today. You can go work on your, you can go work on your listening skills while we, uh, between now and next week in the next half hour. Yeah. So it's good to see you. Oh, thanks for stopping by, Po Mama Sid. Good to see your uh, message in the chat. I appreciate it. Yeah. So until next week, y'all, I've been Christy. You've been awesome. Have a great week. Be happy. Be healthy. Be safe wherever it is and whenever it is you are. All right. Catch you later.